Welcome to the Upshot interview series. This is episode number 32, and today we'll be joined by Jeff Spring. He's the CEO of the Disc Golf Pro Tour and the Tour Director and the Tournament Director for both the Portland Open and the Green Mountain Championships, which just happened this past weekend. Josh, we get a chance to catch up with Jeff about the 2022 season and what's to come in 2023. Yeah, I think we get a lot of good details, get to talk to him about some things that I think uh, you know our listeners and a lot of fans have just kind of been wondering in terms of what the plan looks like moving forward for the Disc Golf Pro Tour. It really feels like in previous years, the Disc Golf Pro Tour has been very active in their intentions and goals in that announcement and publicizing of them. And it doesn't feel like it's been quite as much of the case this season. So it's a good opportunity to talk to him about where he feels like the tour is and is going for the 2023 season. So we'll check in about, of course, you know, events, what the schedule is going to look like next year, uh, crowd control issues. We've been discussing a bunch lately, uh, the, uh, you know, at, at events this season. And uh, of course, things like discipline for players, what the tour cards can look like next year. So much to catch up on as we uh, talk with Jeff Spring. So we'll take a quick break. And when we come back, Jeff Spring joins us here on the Upshot interview series. The Upshot is presented by Pound Disc Golf, makers of the best bags in the sport. The new smaller pound bag, the Rufus, is out now. Round two production is underway. You can go over to pounddiscgolf.com and check out some brand new colorways and many options available for your Rufus look and feel. Custom Rufus packs coming soon. Go to pounddiscgolf.com and get yourself a Rufus today. Joining us now on the Upshot interview series is Disc Golf Pro Tour CEO and Tour Director Jeff Spring. Jeff, welcome back to the program. Thanks for having me. I'm in the car headed to Maple Hill from Vermont, so uh, appreciate you know understanding these interesting circumstances. Well, I I think the car is the best time to take meetings, so uh, we appreciate you finding some time for us in the interstitials of the tour. Um, just really quickly, we got the million dollar shot coming up this week at MVP. What's the odds you think somebody hits this ace and wins a million bucks? I think they're very low, uh, but that's part of the excitement. If, if we see a million dollar ace hit, um, they're going to beat the odds by quite a bit. Um, I know the, the insurance on it was not, not nothing, um, but... Yeah, I, I would say low odds, Charlie. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, we appreciate you taking some time. It's been it's been quite the season. Uh, how would you assess 2022 so far for the tour? Oh, it's just been another year of uh, fantastic growth for the tour. Uh, with growth comes uh, new challenges. Um, so, you know, positives and negatives, but we wouldn't have it any other way. Um, yeah, we, we have seen subscriber growth. We've seen growth in purses, uh, growth in players, new formats. And, um, all along, I think that our, our team and our staff's been improving and, and the players have been putting out a, a fantastic product, uh, working hard and showing why they're professionals. So, um, overall, you know, it's been a banner year, you know, we, we couldn't ask for anything else. Last year, or the beginning of this year, I guess in the off season when we were chatting with you, you said that in terms of the financial goals of the tour, you were expecting to be turning a profit this year. Is that going to happen? You know, it'll depend on how things close at the end of this season. We have big goals for the tour championship, so we're doing our final assessment of uh, what the purse will be and and what our our goals should be. Um, but you know, I think we'll we'll be close. Um, the, we've certainly had some challenges, uh, as you know, that probably every business is f f facing this year, um, with in inflation, really high travel costs, um, and, uh, some uh, unexpected challenges in those areas. So, you know, our expenses are up as, as probably anybody in the world could have predicted. Um, but we've also seen subscriber growth beat our goals. And as the primary revenue driver, the, the tour, you know, media has been, has been growing and, um, especially on the live side and 
you know, we've been reaping some of the benefits there. Um, we've also seen great spectator growth. Um, and we continue to see, you know, great brand growth with merchandise sales and, and people coming out and wanting to, you know, be a part of the Disc Golf Pro Tour and the Disc Golf Network brand. So, um, you know, we've, we've had some wins and some losses and, um, you know, it'll come down the stretch here in terms of that one. Where are you right now with Disc Golf Network subscribers? Have you eclipsed 40,000, 50,000 subscribers? Yeah, you know, we... Uh, we keep the specifics um, on that, but uh, when we hit milestones, uh, I'm happy to share them publicly. You know, we did we did break the 40,000 subscriber mark, um, and really proud of our team um, in in the studio on the grounds, uh, you know, across the country uh, for their hard work in, in getting to that goal. That was our primary season goal, and and we've gotten there. Um, so. Uh, we're thrilled, uh, and we want to just thank the subscribers. We know that it's not always a perfect product, but we, we like to put everything we can into improving the product uh, week in, week out. Um, and a big shout out to the director of Disc Golf Network, Mahmoud Barani, for his continued uh, passion and excellence leading that team. We've got a, a listener question about the Disc Golf Network. They ask, is Dif Disc Golf Network locked into an agreement with Vimeo? And if for if so, for how long? And have you considered other partnerships for DGN at the expiration of that contract? It's a great, it's a great question. You know, Vimeo is one of several live streaming partners that we bring together to deliver the Disc Golf Network. Um, they are a critical partner that delivers a lot of our uh, CDN services or content delivery. Um, and, you know, we've had our ups and downs. Uh, with them, but I think the one thing um, that all of our, you know, subscribers as well as, um, you know, probably fans and followers can agree is that, um, you know, we've seen improvement uh, and we've certainly built a successful uh, platform with Vimeo. So, you know, while we have our frustrations, we're, we're certainly thankful for that partnership. Um, we are assessing uh, what next steps could be there um, and we'll be making some decisions in the near future, whether to renew contracts with, with Vimeo um, or, you know, move in a different direction. So I, I want to ask, um, you know, in the, in the media sphere, one of the things we've seen as kind of seeming like a priority for the tour the last couple of years has been, uh, you know, working with uh, t television networks and ESPN in particular to air some content. Uh, I have seen no mention of that or heard nothing about that here in 2022. Are you planning still to pursue that as a direction or are you moving away from that avenue of trying to reach new people? Uh, we're certainly not moving away with it. We're, uh, we're focusing a little bit on 2023 and throughout 2022, we've really invested in the live product um, instead of kind of not quite diluting, but, you know, dividing our focus, uh, if that makes sense, Charlie. Um However, we, we do plan to air the, the Tour Championship on ESPN2, um, and those, those announcements should be coming in, in short order. Um, you know, we've done that since 2020. We did it last year. We plan to do it this year. And, um, you know, the, the other efforts on ESPN2 on post-production, we found uh, to be valuable, but not maximizing, you know, our ability to reach new people. So we really are focused on improving the live product, with the with the goal of bringing the live product um, to ESPN or to another you know national broadcast partner uh, when we have that opportunity and and you know those discussions are actually happening now so uh, I feel that you know the live the live product um, is the more compelling uh, product to put you know out into the atmosphere of you know the national media landscape and. Um, you know, on our on our path there, we just need to continue to improve what we're able to do, uh, you know, on the grounds in the in the control room, and uh, that's what we've been focused on this year is you know trying new things, doing some extended broadcasts, having the ability to really you know technically deliver a very stable stream um, to whoever our international broadcast partner is when we decide to push some live streams, um, you know, kind of outside of DGN, but that's that's another element um, that we could talk about in, in and of itself, which is, you know, we really value our, our subscription network and our subscribers. And, 
you know, uh, when there's any conflict between, you know, exclusivity or delivering content on the disc golf network versus, you know, putting it out into a national, you know, platform, um, we're always going to side, I think with our subscribers and, um, that's what we've done so far, you know, when we've had opportunities, um, and exclusivity becomes involved, uh, we, we kind of turn those down in favor of, you know, prioritizing the subscriber experience and making sure we're not just delivering the content that we announced at the start of the season, but more, um, and, and we are delivering more and more content, um, than, than what was originally announced. And, and we're, uh, we're happy about that. So, you know, that's, that's kind of a balance that is, uh, you know, something to consider. Uh, but I do think that we're going to find a way to, uh, to bring our live, uh, our live stream to the national audience, uh, while preserving all of the content on the disc golf network in, in 2023. One of the, with the, the, and, and I've noticed some changes this season as well, but one of the, I think the most c- common themes that I see on social media. So of course you take that with a grain of salt is about the commentators on the disc golf network. Does the disc golf pro tour feel that pressure from the, the subscribers about the commentating situation and if any steps are being made, what are they in order to try and resolve those? Yeah, you know, we we really have operated on a, on a yearly basis, Josh. Um, and, you know, I don't know if we'll continue to. But, you know, when we went into this season, um, we had a, a strategy to, you know, improve commentary. Um, and I think it's worked generally. And I, I think that, you know, despite individual, you know, moments or feedback from social, um, I would, I would generally say that I feel that the the social spaces are telling us commentary is improved. And so, you know, we also value relationships in our way of doing business and, um, that way of doing business honors our contracts, um, respects the, the, the people that we work with, um, supports the people that we work with and tries to build environments where they can excel at their, their highest level. Um, and so, you know, throughout the, the season, um, we stick to what our plan was at the start of the year and, uh, and move forward, you know, with that confidence uh, and giving that confidence to our commentary team. Um, it's very important uh, in our estimation, you know, that everybody you know, knows where they stand and that their contracts are valid throughout the, throughout the year. And I know, uh, you know, in professional sports and, and in a media landscape across the world, um, I'm sure it's maybe a little bit more cutthroat than that. Um, but, you know, we're in a position right now where, uh, you know, that's not our value. That's th- those aren't our values, you know. Uh, so, you know, when I, I go back to the start of the season, we, we made a plan. We're sticking to that plan. Um, and when we come into this off season, uh, we're, we're going to use the evaluation tools we put in place. We're going to continue to uh, give feedback to our commentary team and we're going to set up new contracts for next year. Uh, whether those are, are full year contracts, half year contracts, or, uh, you know, have some outs or, or something like that, you know, who knows. But um, all I can say is that as a whole, I'm, I'm really proud of our commentary team. There's a lot more that goes into it than what folks, you know, hear and see on their screen. And, um, you know, down down to the person, you know, I'm, I'm proud to be working with our team. Um, and I think they've done a fantastic job um, despite, you know, uh, social commentary. And, and what I will say is that, you know, the minute you make a change, some people are going to love it. Some people are going to hate it with over 40,000 subscribers. You know, we could have, you know, you know, 4,000 people screaming from the top of their lungs about something. And that's only one tenth of our subscribers. So, you know, you got to take it with a grain of salt. Um, that said, we are, we are listening. We are, we are sensitive and, and we, we do integrate, you know, viewer feedback, um, whether it's social or through our subscriber surveys into our decision making. So, you know, we appreciate the fans and, and them, you know, letting us know how they feel. Uh, earlier this season, we saw a sponsorship with Epic Games. And I know this is one of many efforts in order to increase sponsorships from non-endemic companies. Uh, it felt like with the Epic Games, that it was kind of a... Like the, the, there was a, a press release that got removed, uh, or like a tweet that got removed, and then we people weren't quite sure. And then there were like Fortnite ads. I think it was during the Portland Open. Is Epic Games a was that just a single tournament sponsorship, 
Are they going to be a sponsor in the future? What kind of was going on with that situation? And then maybe you can speak more broadly about what the sponsorship sponsorship situation for non-endemic companies looks like. Yeah. Um, no, we were thrilled. Absolutely thrilled to work closer with Epic Games. Um, you know, that partnership was for the Portland Open. Um, and, you know, they came on online through, you know, the desire to, to reach out and uh, work with the Portland Open specifically. Um, it just so happens that, uh, you know, it's an event that I've, I've put together um, and that I'm an integral part in with, with Brian Cole and the, the Stumptown Disc Golf Club. And Epic Games is out of Seattle, so they want to come down. They, they're huge disc golf fans of a few of their advertising executives, um, and they are very interested in, in growing into the sport um, a little bit more. But they're also one of the non-endemic sponsors and partners that we've had that are, are very focused on on YouTube. In fact, the majority of their advertising is through um, through YouTube, and um, I, I think that uh, you know the the partnership there uh was was focused in that you know i think originally um we had talked about whether or not it would be possible uh to get together uh, a bigger partnership package um i know that yeah the uh, an announcement went out that was um in draft form and we we uh we did take that down um and and you know we did work with epic games um as a partner in the portland open so um that said uh we are talking to them about what we can do in 2023. Um, they're interested in getting on board uh, in, in more ways, I think. Uh, but, you know, that's yet to be seen. And, um, you know, our experience at the Portland Open was uh, was fantastic. And we look forward to working with the company then when we're back in their neck of the woods. More broadly, it feels like we haven't seen as many of the outside sponsorships, you know, sort of beyond disc golf, as we did last year, uh, and, and you know maybe that will change with the tour championship. But it, it, is that a point of concern for you? Were you hoping to have a big presenting sponsor this year, or other you know com- companies coming from outside of disc golf and wanting to you know sponsor various pro tour events or the season? Uh, and you know, sort of where do you feel like things stand on that front? It, it's not an immediate concern, no. Um, I, we do have a lot of conversations going, and we have seen a lot of growth. And you know, I, I think that um, where where we're at is in a place of, of patience. Um, we have a lot of things happening in the disc golf world endemically, and in fact, you know, we're sold out of advertising generally on a week to week basis um, with endemic partners and in, in some of those non-endemic partners that are on the fringes um, that work with us regularly. So, you know, there isn't necessarily a ton of room. Um, and, you know, we've had, you know, our offers and, and, and looked at them and, you know, decided you know, to go in a different direction in certain, in certain instances. I think that we value our product really highly and, and we're just looking for the right partner at, at the highest level. Um, and I feel strongly that we're going to bring on more partners in 2023. But you know, 20, 2022 has been you know really a year of of improvement, growth internally, um, and you know I we have so so much as I mentioned to handle just just internally. And and I think that when we talk about you know outside partners, uh, we want to bring them in while not squeezing out people that have supported us and, and got us here. Uh, because the industry certainly has a high level of interest in, in advertising and partnering on the course, on the stream. Um, so, yeah, I mean, hopefully that sums it up. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't have any hard answers. I'm not concerned. I'm really excited about the future. Um, I don't think that 2022 was necessarily like thrown down as, as the year where um, we're going to, you know, kind of take a, a really big step into a national spotlight, whether it's with media distribution or whether it's with, um, you know, kind of national uh, brands, corporate partnerships. Um, but I, I do see that coming. You know, I, I, I can tell you I really expect great progress going into 2023 um, and going into the future years. Uh, but I don't know if there's going to be like a, uh, a, a switch that we flip, you know, last year into our championship we had a great trio of partners. I expect 
um, to announce in the next week or two another great trio of partners for the Tour Championship. And I think we're going to be living in the in a very similar similar spot, um, you know, come the end of this year. Uh, but the magic uh, of you know kind of a breakthrough, I think, will will come slowly and will come with increased distribution uh, that is kind of built on increased support. And, and we have all the right building blocks for that. And um, I think right now, uh, patience is key. And, uh, you know, if, if we don't see a deal we love, um, you know, we're in a position where we can say, you know, thanks, um, but we're going to go on to the next one. What does the 2023 schedule look like? Are there any notable changes, whether that be adding or cutting events or promotion or demotion of events that you can announce right now? Well, you know, I know Upshot listeners love breaking news. Um, so this isn't quite breaking news, but we will announce the schedule next week. Um, so, you know, get ready, <laughs> I would say. Um, and, you know, it's always kind of traditionally coming out uh, right after the end of the regular season. Uh, and now that we have the playoffs, it'll come out right after the end of the playoffs before the, the Tour Championship and the, the U.S. Championship here. Um, but you know, we're, uh, really, really, I think, you know, we're talking about what, what were the big things that happened this year for this golf pro tour? If it wasn't, you know, a big increase in national media, if it wasn't a big increase in corporate sponsorship, I I really point to, you know, most of our, our extra energy, uh, it went to Europe, honestly. And, um, I expect to, you know, kind of continue to grow in Europe. Uh, I, I can't tell you how proud I am of our team. Um, for executing the two European broadcasts with the PCS Sula Open and the European Open. Um, I think they went fantastic. Um, great storylines. And, you know, behind the scenes, a lot of the subscriber growth we've seen here at the end of the year has, has come from the European market um, coming on and being excited about uh, what they're seeing on the Disc Golf Network. And um, what I can tell you is that we'll be back in Europe. Um, we're excited to do um you know more in europe and you know the the rest of the schedule it looks it looks fairly similar i think we're we're taking baby steps forward um in terms of the format of the tour points in terms of how you get onto the tour how you earn your disc golf pro tour card and um you know just excited for the next couple months to, to keep sharing some of these uh these advances publicly a couple of follow-up questions with that number one are there any updated standardized criteria for pro tour and silver series events for the 2023 season yeah absolutely you know like our our tour standards uh our event expectations and in terms of agreement advance every year so um you know once we get to the end point of those um you know contracts and, and say okay this is our standards for 2023 um we jump in and start start adding and, and editing for 2024. Um, so yeah, there there have already been you know increases throughout the year um, in, in different parts and, and pieces um, of the tour contracts. And um, yeah, I, I, you know specifically, you know, happy to answer any questions. But um, what I can say is is yes, there's there's increased you know standards and and uh, needs from the Disc Golf Pro Tour uh, from the events and you know, benefits for being on the Disc Golf Pro Tour uh, two events. And then my, my other follow-up question is, you know, you mentioned about the different changes of getting on tour for tour card holders. Are there any major announcements or substantial changes that people should be aware of, of the way in which people will get on tour and then the benefits to tour card holders? Um, yes. Generally, yes. Like they, you know, we have been working on a qualifying series um, in order to get your tour card that's outside of the Disc Golf Pro Tour uh, point series. We've talked about this in the past, and um, you know, we're putting the finishing touches on that and looking at the final events that will make, um, you know, make that series up. Um, but I think that uh, it's going to be a trial run. You know, I, kind of every every year that we're doing something new. Um, it's, we're piloting it and, you know, I think we've got a good structure for it, but, uh, you know, I know one of the needs is if you don't have your tour card and you can't play in every single disc golf pro tour event, you know, how do you, how do you get on 
the tour. And, uh, you know, I, we're, we're trying to start answering that question um, in the form of a, a qualifying series. I have to press you one more time on the 2023 schedule. Are there how many new Elite Series events will we have this year? Um, I'm not going to I'm not going to say exactly how many new Elite Series events there will be, but I think you can expect it uh, to be it, around three. <laughs> OK, <laughs> approximately three. All right, cool. Um, Give or take. What, um, what what's the oh, uh, what's the pro tours involvement with the majors? You know, there was this whole fanfare last winter when, you know, the national tour kind of folded into the pro tour and the pro tour is going to be helping with the majors. And like, what exactly does that look like right now? Um, you know, I still think that there's noticeable differences between like a PDGA world championship and then like a regular season pro tour event. So how, how does that work right now? Yeah, you know, this is an evolving uh, partnership you know, with the PDGA. Um, so I, I think that it will continue to grow, kind of grow into it on both sides. Um, right now, you know, we are uh, overseeing all of the media coordination, the media rights, um, you know, the media policies. Um, and just in and of itself, that's a, that's a pretty big task at, at majors. Um, there's a lot of media that wants to come in. Um, and our team has done a pretty good job sorting through it, making sure we're, we're making the right calls on approvals, um, the right calls on, you know, making sure there's not hundreds and hundreds of people, you know, clogging up, you know, player areas uh, wanting to get media, um, but then also delivering quality media through the Disc Golf Network and our post-production media team partners. Um, additionally, uh, you know, our focus has been on um, operational support, primarily spectator, spectator management. Um, you know, as, as spectators have come on the tour more and more and more, um, you know, we've, we've been scaling up what we do with spectators, whether it's ticketing at the gate, parking, logistics, communication, but then also spectator management on courses. So, um, we're working closely with the event team and the PDGA at majors, uh, to make sure that that, that's set. Um, we're also uh, administering tour card benefits at majors. Um, you know, we have our list of tour card benefits that are extended to actual on-site um, perks. Um, we bring Seth Munsey and uh, his disc golf strong, you know, uh, training areas for warm up and cool down. Uh, we bring hospitality tents. We organize the autograph and, and fan interaction. Uh, at the majors and um, you know additionally we we work with them on you know competition you, some of us were um, officials at the events this year um, myself our assistant tour director Phil uh, Delaunay um, served as as tournament officials and we're involved in, in planning meetings you know throughout so we're basically just supporting um, you know the competition in any way we can and providing op operational support for the PDGA team. And, you know, even as we went through the majors this year, um, you know, our teams have, you know, worked you know, closer and closer together. We have Jeff Chiqua, the, the PDGA uh, director of competition, and his staff um, sending representatives to every Disc Golf Pro Tour event. Um, and they're also supporting us on the competition side and in the advancement and execution of, uh, you know, PDGA rules on site. So, Hopefully that gives you a good picture. This year at the European Open, the uh, issue of Nico Castro and his suspension became a big topic of discussion around discipline. And I think it's been a big question about what discipline for touring pros looks like. Does the Disc Golf Pro Tour have its own disciplinary process for tour card holders? And does this agreement extend to behavior off the course, which the PDGAs obviously does not? Yeah, this is a this is a good question, Josh. Um, so we follow the PDGA disciplinary process. Um, we, in our agreement uh, to merge into the uh, national tour, agreed to, to follow that process and also agreed to follow PDGA rules. But that said, we have provisions for development um, in a collaborative way. So 
this is season one. Um, we're, we're going into season two and I expect, you know, these, uh, areas to continue to evolve. So, you know, basically, um, discipline from the PDGA does not include our feedback, you know, whatsoever. So, you know, we didn't, I didn't have any input on, on Nico suspension. In fact, I don't even think any of the staff of the PDGA had any input. I believe that the process, uh, is, is done by the disciplinary committee. Um, and it's really, uh, a group of, you know, the, I think they, they, their committee members, board members, maybe some staff, but then they put it to the PDGA board, um, and the board either accepts it or, you know, I'm not sure what type of, uh, process goes on there. Um, uh, but it is, it is done. So, uh, in a way to basically, uh, keep it very neutral, um, and keep the PDGA staff, um, in their opinions, you know, outside of the decision-making process. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't think it's a bad system. Um, I do think that the Disc Golf Pro Tour um, has disciplinary uh, needs that go beyond or just are different from, uh, you know, the PDGA membership as a whole. Uh, the PDGA recognizes that. And uh, I think it's a, it's a tricky problem. So it's one we've been thinking about and talking about. Um, you know, you don't want to make double standards. You don't want to make um, send the wrong message to, you know, the hundreds, thousand plus PDGA members on, you know, hey, you do something and it's it's different than what a pro does when they do it. Um, but that said, there are very real differences. And um, I, I believe that we will work to amend, you know, the disciplinary process as it relates to Disc Golf Pro Tour tour card holders. And I, I think we want, just want to do it in a way that, that makes sense and doesn't create, you know, a double standard where someone's being dis, just disciplined less. Um, the, the, the hot topic on this is, is find um, an amateur player or just a normal PDGA member, or regional pro, um, probably isn't looking to be fined heavily um, for, for disciplinary uh, issues. Um, whereas it seems to us that there, there is a place for fines in uh, the tour card holder disciplinary process. And um, we're starting that next year. Our, the Disc Golf Pro Tour Player Council started this year, um, seven members on that. And we've asked them to put together a draft of, you know, kind of off the, off the course fines um, that they think are appropriate. They uphold the, the professionalism um, that we expect from Disc Golf Pro Tour, tour card holders. So off the field, we're working on it. We have purview on that. Um, on the course, uh, you know, we, we are working hand in hand with the PDGA um, to kind of just push disciplinary uh, matters uh, to the next level, acknowledge the differences between their membership and tour guard holders, and, and really just avoid double standards. I can't say, you know, when that will be implemented. Uh, because we're just talking about it and they're pretty far ahead on, you know, 2023 rules changes. Um, so I can't guarantee you're going to see much for 2023, but I can say that, you know, through our partnership, uh, you know, I expect, you know, the disciplinary process to continue to evolve. Awesome. Th thanks for a really comprehensive answer there. I, I think uh, I'd love to turn attention a little bit to GMC the path to worlds for next year starts now as i'm sure you're already well aware uh and you're the td at the green mountain championships what do you take away from this year's event uh sort of looking ahead to worlds and you know use it to inform what your plans will be for uh running the the biggest major next year yeah you know uh it was a great event this year uh Certainly felt 2018-esque with the amount of spectators that we had. Um, you know, Saturday on Brewster was electric um, with a lot of roars from across the course. Um, we, you know, have uh, the process of some course changes underway already. Um, some permitting going on right now uh, to change a few things on both courses. Um, in 2018, we, I think, added the new hole eight and nine on Brewster and added 15 and 16 on Fox uh, and, and changed the courses kind of two holes. I, we're going to 
probably be doing a little bit more change on Brewster for next year. Um, you know, and probably adding two two holes, but significant changes on four four different holes. Um, and so we'll also lose some holes there. Uh, however, um, it's not just the course design, it's preparation for a bigger crowd. So, you know, we have a project in process that we're really hopeful gets to fruition that we could kind of reroute the driveway near, you know, Fox 1 and 18 that you see there, um, which would allow us to bring in some, some bleachers behind of 1 and 18. Um, and it would also you know, kind of create more, more bandwidth there. Uh, reduce any traffic issues there that hopefully don't really come across to the viewers at home um, and and just kind of create a, a much bigger and, and grander scene um, there. And, you know, the changes on Brewster are going to be designed to bring in more crowds. You know, we're certainly looking for uh, clearing and more spectator areas. And uh, that goes the same, same for Fox. We're going to tweak a couple things to allow for flow uh, and for, you know, great spectating uh, kind of across the the entire the entire complex. So you know we learned a lot from this year, um, having a having a really nice sized crowd out there, and um, we're just kind of like prepping and bracing for a uh, for a big one next year. One of the things that we've heard a lot this year from people who've been out at Pro Tour events uh, across the year has been crowd control. Uh, we've had VIP pass holders write in to complain that their VIP badge means nothing. Uh, we've seen instances of people kind of just like walking across the fairway. Uh, and then just at GMC, we had umbrella gate. I don't know how much of a gate it really was, but we did have people just like leaving stuff in bounds. What is the plan for the pro tour and on the crowd control front? Are you satisfied with what has happened so far this year? Do you, do you see a need to make changes? And if so, what are those changes? Well, let me preface this by saying, you know, like you've got a, maybe hundreds of thousands, if not millions of opportunities to have, have something uh, distract the player or have a, an instance where, you know, something is didn't go right. Um, and, you know, I would say that our, our crowd control efforts have been scaled up. Our operations team has done a great job um, and, you know, to the point of your question, are there are there moments where something isn't isn't perfect? Um, sure, yeah, there are. Um, and does that make it seem a certain way uh, publicly? Uh, I would say maybe it colors it a little too strongly uh, versus the reality of what's happening out there. I think, um, as I kind of mentioned, <laughs> the subscriber uh, you know comment about you know having a lot of people. Uh, there's a lot more chances for, for things, for something to, you know, kind of not go as planned. Um, so I just want to, I just want to preface the question just by recognizing that, that, you know, I think you can get it right 99% of the time um, or 99.9 and the 0.1 or the 1% of the time that, you know, something, you know, happens, uh, it can, it can kind of color, color things in a different way from the majority of reality. Uh, that said, of course, we're trying to improve. We're trying to, you know, kind of learn from any mistake that happens and make sure it doesn't happen again. You know, the, one of our core values of the Disc Golf Pro Tour is continual improvement. And with continual improvement, you really need to understand when you make a mistake or you allow for something to happen and say, hey, we got that wrong. We got to do it better next time and admit to that. So, um, you know, I'm not here to say that we're perfect, um, but I, I just... At the same time, have to recognize the great, the great uh, performance and, and hard work of our operations team. So specifically, you know, I think Umbrella Gate is a good thing to talk about because um, specifically, you know, we have multiple um, crowd control in front of that card, and I was on the tee behind the card with our crowd control team. Uh, we're on comms, you know, and so there we are, you know, saying is the green clear, and our, our crowd control team comes up and says, yeah, yeah, it is clear. You know, the spectator in question was in a general admission area, um, which is like by 17 and 16. And it seems like they just kind of wandered over to that green. Uh, the answer in this specific instance is that we should have had a rope up that didn't allow that person to get that close 
Um, and so the answer in the future on a lot of this is, is kind of roping the entire course and making sure that if somebody's going to get onto the course, they're ducking a rope. Um, even at PGA events, any, any big sporting event, like you guys talked about it on your podcast, court side seats, there is some element of if somebody does something stupid, like they're going to have an effect on play. Like if somebody got up from court side and ran onto the court, that's, that's going to have an effect on play. Correct. Um, if they put their drink down, J- Jason Kidd intentionally spilled a cup of soda all over the floor so he could take an extra time out. Yeah. A classic, a classic NBA moment. Exactly. And so, you know, the green was clear when people were throwing, um, and, uh, a spectator came up and made a bad decision. Um, and it's, it's regrettable. And the answer is that we need to, you know, kind of have ropes as, as we've, as we've done. I mean, you know, we've worked with Doug and, and DD, um, for DDO and worlds and what he, uh, laid out for the, uh, Emporia country club is, is a lot like what we're going to be doing more and more of in the future where, you know, it's pretty clear, you know, where you can and can't go. Um, because, you know, you can't solve this with, you know, a hundred people per se. Um, we do have people there. There was someone up there, um, at the green, you know, that was on our crowd control staff. Um, and they did clear the green. Um, we had a, a crowd that was on the chase card where, you know, every day they were pervasive, uh, pushing that crowd out of the way, telling us on comms that they're clear. Um, so it wasn't, you know, it wasn't just something that was overlooked. It was just, you know, something unfortunate that happened. So, you know, we, uh, we do a really good job. You know, I, I can't tell you uh, one thing, you know, we talked about what's grown in the disc golf pro tour. One thing I can say is we started the year with probably like 4,000 feet of rope in our trailers and, and we have well over 20,000 feet of rope now. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, it, it's something that uh, is necessary to keep, continue to usher in the next phase of, of, you know, having more and more spectators. Like, you know, we only had like, you know, a thousand, twelve hundred people, you know, out there at peak for, for GMC. We want to have 3000 people on the course next year. You know, we want to have, you know, all the elite series events, all the disc golf pro tour events, eventually with 5,000 people on the course, um, before we move up to the, that next level. And so right now our planning is around how do we, how do we manage 5,000 people, whether it's parking lots, entry gates on course, uh, making sure that it doesn't have an effect on competition. Um, but you know, uh, pro sports with a lot of spectators, you know, some, some, some sports are lucky. I think golf is tough. Um, I, I watch PGA tour golf. Um, and you know, a lot of times there are some weird bounces when you hit it into the gallery in the rough and, um, some are lucky, some are unlucky. Um, this one, we don't really know, right? I, I think our, I think Nate and Nate Sexton and Doss thought it was going out. You guys aren't so sure who knows. Um, but it, but it happened and it's happened before I can tell you, I think it will happen again, but we're going to do everything we can to prevent it from happening as we're, as we're trying to do now. I I just have one super quick follow up before Josh asks his next question. Do you think that we need to move spectators off the OB lines to areas further back to allow for the flight of the disc to cross over OB or rollers to go through the OB or et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. We, and, and again, something we're doing now where Ricky threw out, um, over OB is a good example on 14. We, we could have had a bunch of spectators right and short, um, where there is OB, but we, we made sure there are no spectators right in short watching a disc fly over their head or if a low disc came in. Um, but there are many areas uh, like that where people are going to throw out over OB. For instance, in the past, we've let spectators spectate on the road of 18 uh, on Fox. This year, we, we did not allow that to happen. We, we made sure all spectators were off the road, um, that the lines were there in practice. The players knew where the lines out of bounds were going to be, you know, so they could plan their shot. Because if, if there's going to be barricades there that might affect the shot, they got to be there when they're practicing. So we had our barricades up on, on Monday um, on hole 18, and the players could see, hey, if I'm going to go out over there, I can't go low. I might hit this barricade, right? And that's where the spectator line was. So that's just an example. Like, yeah, you're absolutely right. Like, we need to think about, and we do, like, 
you know, Mabel Hill, like we're thinking about, hey, where could the disc be flying? What type of shots are the players throwing? Where did the spectator lines go? And um, yeah, uh, it, it's it's absolutely necessary. Hole six at Fox Run, and I'll preface this: uh, the Green Mountain Championship is my favorite event every year. Thank you, Josh. I'm, yeah, I'm glad I think. To hear that. I think it's the best set of courses, and as soon as it was announced that it was for Worlds, my wife and I planned our vacation to come. So, big fan. Hole six, Fox Run Meadows, dubbed as the easiest hole in disc golf. Is it going to be around for Worlds next year? Well, let me let me start by saying that Ricky went OB on that. I, I'm pretty sure um, the final day. He did. Right? Yeah. So not so easy now, huh, Josh? But. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, it is. It, we that is one of the holes we're planning on changing. Um, it is tough. Um, I think you could you could say that it is a you know kind of like a a filler hole. Um, it is kind of necessary in the current flow to make what uh, we can out of what we have. But um, thinking creatively, you know, uh, Steve Brinster and I were out there uh, this year looking at that hole, um, and feeling and, and knowing that. You know, it, it could really use an upgrade. Um, and so I, I believe that there will be a change there. Um, if not for the FPO division, certainly for the MPO division. Um, in fact, it, it's not one of the easiest holes for FPO. It's not an easy hole for me. I'll say that. I usually, <laughs> <laughs> it's not, they make it look much, much easier. Um, but, you know, like I think that, um, you know, that's one we've had our eyes on for a while. We've, we've come up with some solutions. It's going to take a little bit of work, but um, I think that you'll be happy to know uh, we plan on changing it. I mean, I, I'm a big fan of it. I have one follow-up question. Are mozzarella sticks both off the tee and around the basket in consideration in order to make this hole more difficult? <laughs> All right. So the, the short answer is no. <laughs> the okay. short answer is no. The, the long answer is that um, <laughs> all, all of my team will uh, kind of kind of laugh to hear me tell this story. But um, I, I want to make the claim that I, I think I was the original uh, person who dubbed them mozzarella sticks. Um, I was on a practice round with Nate Doss, and they looked kind of like that, that interesting texture because they wrapped the green around it. And I, I said mozzarella sticks, and, and Doss was laughing quite a bit. The next day, we played with Sexton, and we told him, and he thought it was funny. And then he said it on Jomez Pro. So I don't know who gets the credit on this, but, uh, you know, I, I think I'm in the running. So, <laughs> so. does this mean does this mean we're going to have a Jeff Spring Arby's signature mozzarella sticks <laughs> USDGC disc? Yep. I hope not. I hope not. Sponsor no, activation. <laughs> you wanted I, I, the credit, I, Jeff. I'm just taking this to the logical I'd conclusion. rather say that on the broadcast than yeet. I will just put that <laughs> oh, out there. Oh, man. Okay. You know, I didn't, I didn't have, I, nobody asked me for the sign off on that one, Charlie. So um, <laughs> I'm not going to, oh, you can't blame, no. you can't quite blame me for that one. But um, yeah, I was surprised to hear that one too. But no, in all honesty, about the mozzarella sticks, um, you know, I got a lot of respect for for the USDGC team. Uh, Andrew Duvall, Harold, Jonathan. I, I think that they've been innovating for years in many ways that have helped push our game forward. You know, regardless of how you feel about them, they're going through the effort and you know, really having the courage and the chance, like the the hutzpa to to take a chance and, and try something new. Um, but, you know, I figure, you know, I, I would tell that story because, you know, Sexton's there, like, in of his team captain. So if he can, if he can poke fun, you know, anybody can. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, uh, super quick thing. Why does USDGC not count towards tour points? It's really just timing, um, you know, and we're going to think about that next year, actually, quite a bit. Um, because, you know, this year we've always crowned the uh, point series champion uh, at the end of the, you know, final disc golf pro tour event uh, of the year. And that's when, you know, it happened um, this year, Maple Hill final event. We're going to crown the champion uh, right there. So this weekend we'll, we'll see uh, who's point series champions and, um, you know, celebrate them on, on the green of 18 after we celebrate the Maple 
uh, the, the MVP open, uh, champions. Uh, but, you know, I think you bring up a good question. Um, you know, I, right now we counted two of three majors for the men and two of four for the women. Um, I would anticipate, uh, you know, a potential change there. We haven't made the final call, but we're looking at the schedule and saying, you know, maybe we can crown the, uh, disc golf pro tour points champion, you know, at Winthrop as well. So, um, we're thinking about it, Charlie. Is there one, we actually had an email today. We were talking about in a mini mailbag where we had a listener who suggested something like it, He said that the, the point series winner should get a auto buy to the finals of the DGPT championship. <clears throat> but regardless of what the solution is, the point he brings up is right now, there isn't necessarily a tangible difference between taking first and eighth on the MPO side. Have you considered something like a, a bonus, uh, a payout for the top er, points earner, uh, an increased benefit for whoever takes first? Is there anything like that, whether this season or in the works or future seasons? Yeah, ne next season we will do uh, payout to the top three. Um, at least um, there will be a benefit there. I will say that while it's not the biggest benefit you know, in the sport, there are some significant um, positives to finishing first for the tour championship. Um, you you win uh, your tiebreaker, any tiebreaker based on your seed, um, you know, and then, you know, in the top eight versus the top four, top four get to go um, last. So, you know, there is some like some serious strategy. And I'm not just saying this, it's played out year after year after year where people that are coming in with the higher seed, you know, can play uh, a different strategy um, on the final holes because they know where they sit. Um, so there, there is some serious implications in terms of like getting through from the semifinals to the finals um, on, on your seed and where you're sitting. Uh, one more question from our Discord. Uh, what is the Pro Tour's biggest focus in 2023 between player management, you know, tour card benefits, that kind of area of things, event operations, and live fan experience? Um, like, on, I'm taking that to mean like on the course, like live spectator yeah. experience. I mean, I guess you could also add a category, which would be like, you know, fan experience for those at home watching on disc golf network. Okay. Um, <laughs> tough to really tough to really pick one there because they all really go hand in hand. Um, and we're making plans and upgraded and upgrades to, you know, all categories. Um, you know, obviously the, the fans are incredibly important to us, um, whether they're on site or online. Uh, we made some really big upgrades in the disc golf network area um, this year, spending, you know, well over half a million dollars on equipment upgrades and, um, you know, spending probably even more on bringing in more personnel on, on the ground, on site, you know, in the booth. And, um, you know, we're just we're really focused on continuing to improve the, the disc golf network product um, at the same time, you know, on site. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, it's a huge, going to be hopefully a huge upgrade next year. We put a lot of effort into it, um, in this year, but everything starts and ends with us. We're, we're a player's tour. Um, so with the players, you know, that they bring in the fans, we want to make sure that the players have, um, the best experience that they can at our events. Um, and we're, we're absolutely, you know, kind of focused. I, I would say, but if I had to pick one of those, I, what was the first? What was the first category there? Uh, player management, ensuring pros are taken care of. What was the second? Uh, event operations. Event operations. Event fan so, experience. Yeah, I mean, event operations and, and, and fan experience go hand in hand. But I'm I'm taking event operations to mean like preparation for competition and you know course design and, and that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, I, w I would then still pick like, you know, the player experience. I feel that, you know, that's that's where we we start, you know, things, you know, we really want to make sure that we understand the player's mindset. We really want to make sure we are meeting the player's needs um, and fans are built off of 
following you know the players and like i said we're a, we're a players tour that's how we were founded that's how we're going to continue to run um and um yeah uh, not diminishing you know the the fans experience obviously but you know we feel that the you know as long as we get that that player experience right the fans will be there to watch them um and and certainly we've talked so much you know whether it's at the start of the season or now about like all the efforts that we're making on on site and online for fans um and then you know obviously we we would talk about our our event teams uh who are uh the third stakeholder in this and you know that it, it'll be interesting you know we are working hard to make sure that the three primary um stakeholders in in kind of the event business um you know are, are happy going in next year we we learned a lot about that um this year i think we'll continue to keep learning um but whether it's the players the event teams or the tour you know they kind of create this experience for the fans um and we want to make sure that the three main stakeholders in executing this um you know are all happy um and are all feeling good about the future good about the the format and the structure of the tour and um yeah i, I feel like we're we're on a great path for, for significant upgrades in those relationships and, and the fans will benefit. Jeff, thanks so much for, for giving us some time. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. And um, it's always great to talk to you, Charlie and Josh. Jeff Spring, CEO and Tour Director of the Disc Golf Pro Tour. Jeff, uh, have fun at Maple Hill. Should be a good one. Absolutely. Josh, see you next year in Vermont. See you in Vermont.